Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. <laughs> and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to uh, give this talk. It's a subject which I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about. Um, first of all, I have no specific conflicts of interest to uh, declare. I, I'm, I'm a part of many different organizations, um, including the union, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, but the views that are, I'm expressing to you today are my own views and not on behalf of any organization. Um, I am very proud, though, of the role that the union has played in tuberculosis control over a very long period of time. Many of you will be aware of the DOTS model for tuberculosis control, which has been the dominant global model for TB control since the early 1990s. And this model was developed by our colleagues at the union uh, well before my time, but the, it is part of the union's responsibility. And there were two key elements of the DOT strategy which remain, which were, which remain true today. Um, the DOT strategy was aiming and is aiming to eliminate TB by finding and successfully treating all infectious cases of tuberculosis. All people finding all the infectious cases and making sure that all of the cases that are found and diagnosed are effectively treated. That was the core basis for the DOTS model. Um, and there were many strong benefits of the implementation of the DOTS model for TB control over the last 30 years. In particular, uh, directly observed short course chemotherapy did guarantee um, that there were good treatment outcomes in patients that were diagnosed. And it also did guarantee, if properly adhered to, that there would not be the development of drug resistance. So if patients were observed taking their treatment and they got a good continuous supply of medication, they would not develop multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So these were the two big um, advantages and, and, and strengths of the DOTS model. Unfortunately, over the, a, a period of time, it has become apparent that, that there were significant limitations in what could be achieved with the DOTS model of managing tuberculosis. First of all, the DOTS model as implemented was based on confirming the diagnosis of TB by sputum smear microscopy, Zeal-Nielsen stain, or AFB smear. It's a test that's been around for over 100 years, in fact, over 130 years. It's a very old test, but it remains technically difficult and, more importantly, has very low sensitivity for the diagnosis of TB. We know that only about half of all patients with, tuber with pulmonary tuberculosis actually have a positive direct sputum smear. So a low sensitivity test that you use for the diagnosis will miss many cases. We also now know that many, and this was data that was shown amongst the first times it was shown was here in Vietnam in the Vietnam National Prevalence Survey conducted in 2006 and 2007 that many patients with TB have few or no symptoms. So the DOT strategy relied on 
detecting symptomatic patients, ensuring that patients with uh, specific symptoms, usually cough that lasted for two, more than two weeks, or coughing up blood or weight loss, that those symptoms had been were present and that led the patient to a seek care and would lead to a diagnosis. Unfortunately, it is now apparent that many patients, possibly half, possibly even more than half, of all patients with TB in the community do not have those symptoms and therefore do not seek care. Um, there are other limitations. The DOTS strategy as implemented paid very little attention to patients who already had drug-resistant tuberculosis. And in fact, many patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis um, were treated with standard treatment, which was not effective, and uh, during that period were able to transmit drug-resistant tuberculosis to others. So although DOTS tended to prevent the emergence of drug resistance, it did not prevent the spread of existing drug resistance. Many people also felt that, um, that there were large groups of symptomatic patients with TB who were not adequately cared for under the DOTS model. Children, people with extra pulmonary tuberculosis and people with smear negative tuberculosis. And the final point that I make here is that actually supervising every dose of treatment that is administered requires a workforce that is just not possible to achieve in virtually every country. The countries with a high burden of tuberculosis, a lot of patients to treat, including Vietnam, could not actually achieve the goal of directly observing every dose of therapy because of the workforce limitation. So the union model achieved a great deal, and I think we should be proud of what it has achieved, but it did not end TB. Um, the global community has been very ambitious in setting targets for ending TB, and these are targets that were set in 2015. And the targets are that we should end TB, or virtually end TB, by 2035. And this is the um, projected decline in TB incidents and deaths during the next, between 2015 and 20, between 2015, down here on, uh, between 2015, down here on the left, and 20, uh, and 2035, shown here on the right. So we're very good at setting targets. We're not so good at achieving them. <laughs> um, this is data from the, TB, the Global TB Report, which was published just last week, the most recent version. The WHO re reports on data, global data for TB every year, and the most recent report was published last week. And I should point out, and this is quite difficult because I can, <laughs> I can't see the pointer. I can only see the pointer if I turn around. <laughs> um, so what you should know here is that the x-axis, the y-axis, sorry, the, new, the axis which shows the numbers is a log scale. It's not a linear scale. It's a logarithmic scale. So it tends to make the changes smaller. But what you can see here, is the main line to look at on this graph, the top line, this line. This is the number of, that, that line that I'm pointing to there, doesn't work there. Somebody pointing something for me? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh, okay, this one, okay. Thank you, that's better. Okay, this line shows the number of cases, and this show line shows the rate, the incidence rate. And you can see that there has been some decline, but it's very small. Nothing like as much as what we need to achieve to get 
to uh, TB elimination by 2035. So we, we are very slow. And this is death rates in HIV negative people. And this is also quite slow decline. And in fact, in the last two years since COVID, death rates have increased. And in the last one year, incidence rates have increased. You can see it's gone up slightly. So we're actually going backwards. So we are not doing so well in TB elimination. Having said that, some countries eliminated TB many years ago. Uh, and Australia is one such country. So it's not that it's impossible to eliminate TB. It's perfectly possible to eliminate TB. And it has been eliminated in many countries around the world. In Australia, it was eliminated using the Australian National Tuberculosis Campaign, which started in 1943 and lasted for 30 years. And it included, the campaign included several key elements, which I'm showing here. But the most important element was the second one. We had a national campaign of mass miniature chest X-rays. Everybody had to have X-rays, and it was compulsory. Everybody had to have X-rays at regular intervals. And during this campaign, you can see here, there was a rapid, a really rapid decline in the, this is actually death rates, but similar data for uh, incidents, a very dramatic decline in the incidence and death rates due to tuberculosis. So if you find all the cases, if you search for all the cases and treat them, you will rapidly eliminate tuberculosis. But you have to have a systematic approach to doing it. Similar approach was pioneered by Dr. George Comstock, who was an American epidemiologist and pulmonologist who worked in an area of the United States with a very high burden of tuberculosis, Alaska. Very high burden of tuberculosis. He also adopted a systematic approach both to case finding and also treatment of latent TB infection and produced dramatic declines in the incidence of tuberculosis, a difference between 38 cases in, in one group and four cases in another group. A huge difference in the incidence of tuberculosis with a systematic approach to case finding and treatment. So globally, we are not doing very well on TB control. We've eliminated TB in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, in Northern and Western Europe, in Japan, in Cuba, in fact. But most of the rest of the world, we have not eliminated tuberculosis, including this country here, um, Vietnam, which is dark green and which has a lot of tuberculosis, as do many other countries in this region. Many countries in our region have a very high burden of tuberculosis, as well as in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Um, so we have a long way to go. So in order to think about how we need to eliminate tuberculosis, we need to go back to the concept of prevention. Okay? Prevention is well known in the non-communicable disease com community, but we've tended to forget about it in the communicable disease community. We've tended to forget that you can prevent disease, including communicable diseases. And I want to talk to you about prevention. I communicable diseases like TB start with infection. You start with a population that is at risk. They become infected. Some of those infected people go on to get disease, pulmonary disease. And those poor people with pulmonary disease infect people who are susceptible and they become infected. They have this triangle. Susceptible, infected, disease. Disease leads to infection and so on. So it is a cycle. And the key to ending tuberculosis is breaking that cycle, breaking that chain of transmission. Until we break that cycle, we will not end TB. Um, this slide has a mind of its own. Uh, so 
to, the, the way to, um, to stop TB infection is largely to find and treat every person who has infectious TB that they don't infect other people. If you find and treat all of the people with infectious TB, they will not infect others and you will break the chain of transmission. There are other things you can do. You can do things like infection control to protect people from infection. You can introduce social distancing, reduced crowding, better ventilation as we did with COVID. That will also prevent infection. Um, and vaccines may well have a role, both in preventing infection and in stopping people who are infected going on to get disease. You can improve the management of comorbidities like diabetes, malnutrition, HIV, and you can give treatment to people who have latent TB infection. Unfortunately, when we talk about prevention of TB, much of the discussion focuses only on this point, treatment of latent TB infection. But in fact, prevention of TB involves all seven of these things that I put up in purple. There are seven ways to prevent TB, not just one. So active case finding has been widely talked about as a way of improving the number of cases of TB that we're finding so that we can find and treat most people with TB. And it's ma now it's been widely used in many contexts. But it's main the way it's been used mainly has been in targeting high-risk groups, contact people living with HIV, people who are in other high-risk settings. Um, and the conventional approach has been to find people to do the screening based on symptoms, to look for people who have symptoms of TB. The problem with this approach is that in high burden settings like Vietnam and all other high burden settings, most people with TB are not members of high risk groups. Okay, that's a very important point to recognize. Most people with TB in Vietnam are not contacts they are not people with HIV, they are not malnourished, they are not diabetics. They have none of those risk factors. Most people with TB are just general members of the community. So if you only focus on high risk groups, you will only ever find a small proportion of all people with TB. So there is no point in just focusing on high risk groups if you want to find all of the cases of TB. The second problem, as I've already alluded to, is most people with TB in the general community do not have symptoms. So screening for TB based on symptoms will miss most cases of TB. So the two, the con the two common ways in which active case finding is currently done do not work in high burden settings. Finding, focusing on high risk groups and using symptoms. Um, so we did a study in, um, in Kamau, where we, which is a proof of concept study for um, active case finding. It was published in 2019. Um, in, um, and this is the publication. You'll recognize a few names there from Vietnam. This was a study that was done in uh, I'll just go to this. It was done in Kamau. You, I think you all know where Kamau is. A long way from here, <laughs> the other end of the country. Um, and it has a high burden of tuberculosis. It's a rural, predominantly rural province um, with a lot of fishing and uh, rice farming. We did a randomised control trial, a cluster randomised control trial, which means that we randomized clusters or, or sub-communes. We chose sub-communes, which they call in Kamau apps, um, and we, we randomized them to either active or control. This is a map of Kamau showing the, the, the active 
subcommunes here in, in dark color and the control ones in, in the light color. There are actually about a thousand subcommunes in Kamau and we chose 120, 60 active and 60 control. And the intervention involved, first of all, community engagement. And then we went did a household census. We went from house to house, enumerated the whole population. We then screened the whole population by collecting spontaneously expectorated sputum. And that sputum was tested using the expert MTB RIF platform. Um, this is the diagram we used. Our, our field workers used this diagram to encourage patients to produce sputum and we showed them how to do it. This is one of our, two of our, our staff and one of the householders. As you can see, her job was fixing the fishing nets here. Uh, and she's being interviewed and she produced a sputum specimen. And we did this annually every year for three years in the intervention arm. And then in the fourth year, we went to both the intervention arm and the control arm and did the same thing. And this is what happened to the prevalence of TB. Here you can see year on year, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, there was a 72% decrease in the prevalence of TB over the four years of the study. A massive decrease in the prevalence of TB between the first year and the fourth year. In the final year, we also tested the control group who had not been previously screened. The prevalence in them was actually lower here the first time than it had been in this group at the beginning. And the difference between these was 44%. So from the point of view of the randomised control trial, the effect of the intervention was a 44% reduction in the prevalence of TB. We also, we, in this study, we only screened adults. Only people aged 15 and over were actually screened and treated for TB. But in the final, after the study was done, we did a survey of children living in the villages. So the children had not been part of the study, but they lived in the village where we'd done active case finding. And what you can see is that the prevalence of TB infection, we measured TB infection using the quantiferon test, the prevalence of TB infection was 50% lower among children living in the villages where we'd done active case finding than in children living in the villages where we had not done active case finding. And what this means is that the children living in the villages where we had not done active case finding were much less likely to be exposed to somebody with TB and therefore much less likely to be infected with TB. The last thing that we showed was because we were following people up each year, every year we tested them and so we were able to see who developed TB for the first time during the course of the study. So each year we looked at the people who'd been screened the previous year and who had not had TB and some of those people developed TB and had it when we screened them a year later. So they were truly incident cases of TB. New cases of TB that developed in people who did not previously have TB. So what we, you can see here is in the first year of the study, the incidence of TB was 250 to 100,000. In the second year, it had fallen to about 130 per 100,000. And in the final year, it had fallen to 110 per 100,000. So there was a massive decrease, a 57% decrease in the incidence of TB. So these were not people that we found, and this reduction was not people that we found and treated. These were people who never developed TB. These were people who were prevented from getting TB. Primary prevention of TB. They never got TB. 
Why did they not get TB? They did not get TB because they were not exposed to other people in their community with TB. Because we had found patients with prevalent TB, we had found patients with TB in the population, they were no longer exposed and therefore no longer, sorry, no longer at risk of developing TB. So this, these were TB cases due to recent transmission that were prevented from getting TB. And I've called here this the return on investment. This is what we got. Out. We were able to, these patients were people who never got TB, never needed to be diagnosed, never needed to be treated. And so that's a very important finding from this study, that you can prevent TB by finding and treating prevalent cases. The other thing to note is that in this study we were screening and at the same time patients could attend to the health facilities to be diagnosed with TB. The blue bars represent the cases that were detected by active case finding and the orange sections represent the people who were diagnosed by the routine health care system. So you can see that the vast majority of people with TB who were diagnosed in these villages were diagnosed as a result of screening and not as a result of presenting with symptoms. If we had not been there to find patients, these are the only ones that would have been found. If we had not been screening, we would have just found these few cases. But by screening, we found all these additional cases. That's where we had the advantage. So I think this is a fairly profound proof of concept of the value of active case finding, screening the whole population using a test that does not rely on symptoms and doing it periodically, annually, for three or four years, that you can have a really profound effect in preventing uh, TB and you can see how if you scale this up you could end TB in Vietnam as well as in other high burden settings. So I think we can see a way forward to an integrated pathway for ending TB. Prioritising primary prevention, that is preventing TB infections, but also managing patients who have morbidity and preventing mortality and protecting those who are vulnerable. We need to consider the local epidemiology and we need to target effect and effectively treat trans transmission of drug-resistant TB. We can use new tools. In this case, we used um, uh, expert, but we could also use ultra-portable digital radiology as well as uh, molecular testing of sputum. And we need to optimise the quality of care that we deliver. Just to finish, uh, I would just say that, that there are a few things we can do. We need to move from a proof of concept study to actually doing this in Vietnam at scale, actually getting on with ending TB in Vietnam. And we need to start somewhere. And the key, the key points are, I think, we need to choose high-risk locations and not high-risk individuals. We need to start in the places with most TB, not looking just at high-risk individuals within those places. We need to mobilise the population and we need to make sure that people actually not only accept screening but actually demand it as a way to getting rid of TB. We can use... The, 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 probably the most feasible tool at the moment is to use the handheld digital radiology with AI reading followed by cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification tests cartridge but like expert. We at the same time need to strengthen it, passive case finding so that patients who do present to healthcare facilities do get diagnosed and managed appropriately for TB or for any other health problem, respiratory health problems they have. And we need to ma utilise some of the new tools, modern tools that are available to us like mobile devices for communication and we need to manage data well. You know, we need to make sure that patients who are diagnosed actually get transitioned into care effectively. 
no point in screening for TB and finding people with TB if they don't get on effective treatment and complete effective treatment. And that means home-based care, person-centred care, not facility-based care, molecular testing for drug resistance. We need to make sure that patients are prescribed and dispensed the appropriate regimen and get access to regular supply. And they need support during their treatment. They need financial support, they need psychosocial support, and of course they need medical care during their treatment. Um, I think we can end TB in the near future in Vietnam. I think it's achievable. TB is not a fact of life. It can be got rid of. T Vietnam does not have to have TB. But, and we, there is a pathway to getting rid of TB, but we need, to, we need to engage with all of the key stakeholders in the community and in the political space, and we need to do the work. And I just want to thank my two key collaborators who are here sitting in the front row. They were sitting in the front row another time previously. That was when I took that photograph. They weren't wearing masks at the time, but they are now. Um, so they're in disguise. Um, and a number of other collaborators who are very important uh, in this work. You'll recognise many of them, Dr. Hua, Dr. Uh, Nyung, um, uh, uh, Dr. Biu, you can see there, Dr. Uh, Fuk, uh, Bing, many people you'll recognise in this slide. So I uh, thank you all very much for your support and for listening. Thank you very much.